Today we will examine the peculiar term bioleninism, as coined by Spandrel. Bioleninism, or biological leninism, is a topic that is increasingly present in right-wing discourse, if not in these specific terms. As we go through this topic, I want you to keep in mind Dr. Edward Dutton's idea of spiteful mutants, as it is very much the same idea as Spandrel's. Bio-Leninism comes from a three-part series of blog posts by Spandrel. Parts 1 and 2 will be discussed here. I view these parts as being developmental, whereas part 3 is concise to the point of it not making any sense to edit it at all except to skip the first few introductory sentences. So in the next video, I will just do a near-complete read-through of part 3 without any pauses. Afterwards, there will be another video discussing and building on the ideas, but it will be released at a later date. For now, just consider the idea of bioleninism in of itself, as Spandrel expressed it. Bioleninism explains why, as Mencius Moldbug noted, quote, Cthulhu may swim slowly, but he only swims left, end quote. It is an explanation of how the cathedral formed. Spandrel writes for us a quick summary of the political developments that led to liberalism. Quote, the problem with feudalism is that it's really hard to get anything done. It's hard to raise taxes. It's hard to get anything built. A state, like any organization, but even more so, wants to get things done. It wants to grow, expand its power and influence. And so feudalism led to absolutism. And absolutism led to liberalism. Liberal states were strong, had armies of bureaucrats and tax revenues that feudal states could only dream of. But while they were effective, they were a mess. Feudalism is good at generating loyalty. Liberalism is awful at that. And loyalty is very important. The fundamental problem of politics is the distinction between friend and foe, said Schmidt. A friend is someone who is loyal. End quote. Spandrel has identified the key glue that holds together strong governments, and that is loyalty. Loyalty is reliable. You don't need to spend any time arguing and convincing. A person who is loyal to you will do what you want them to do. Quote, Say what you will about the Soviet Union. The Communist Party was loyal. They got things done. Every crazy and stupid thing that the Politburo approved got done. Yes, it took a while to achieve that result. Stalin had to kill a lot of people. But it wasn't through sheer terror and cruelty that the Communist Party worked. The Communist Party had a system, which worked. The destruction of that world by enlightened liberals resulted in a ruling class which was orders of magnitude less cohesive and orderly. You might be a libertarian and think that is a good thing, and you may have a point, but any organization wants to fight entropy and ensure its stability and reproduction. Liberalism historically has shown itself incapable of that. Leninism was the first solution to that problem." End quote. There is a will to power in the natural order of the world, and states possess it as much as anything else. Liberalism can endure its own contradictions when they are external. Woodrow Wilson in his destruction of the old world, as well as FDR finishing the job, and the neoconservatives in seeking to afflict other nations with the debilitating effects of liberal democracy, all contradicted liberalism in their global Machiavellian politics. On the home front, liberalism must accept the natural hierarchy that emerges. But the problem with the natural hierarchy is that only a minority of people will end up with high status, and thus most people will have no incentive to be loyal to the regime. The people with high status in a liberal system have no particular affinity for each other either. Leninism is a solution to this problem that fulfills the status desires of the majority and creates a cohesive ruling class to see it through. But socialism doesn't just work because it promises higher status. Quote, socialism works not only because it promises higher status to a lot of people. Socialism is catnip because it promises status to people who, deep down, know they shouldn't have it. There is such a thing as natural law, the natural state of any normally functioning human society. Basic biology tells us people are different. Some are more intelligent, more attractive, more crafty and popular. Everybody knows, deep in their lizard brains, how human mating works. Women are attracted to the top dogs. Being generous, all human societies default to a Pareto distribution where 20% of people are high status, and everyone else just has to put up with their inferiority for life. 
That's just how it works. Socialism, though, promised to change that, and Marx showed they had a good plan. Lenin then put that plan to work in practice. What did Lenin do? Exterminate the natural aristocracy of Russia, and build a ruling class with a bunch of low-status people. Workers, peasants, Jews, Latvians, Ukrainians. Lenin went out of his way to recruit everyone who had a grudge against imperial Russian society, and it worked brilliantly. The Bolsheviks, a small party with little popular support, won the Civil War, and became the awesome Soviet Union. The early Soviet Union promoted minorities, women, sexual deviants, atheists, cultists, and every kind of weirdo. Everybody but intelligent conservative Russians of good families. The same happened in China, where e.g. the five provinces which formed the southern Mongolian steppe were joined up into, quote, Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, and quote, what Sailor calls, quote, Consolidate and Surrender, end quote. In communist countries, pedigree was very important. You couldn't get far in the party if you had any little kulak, noble, or landowner ancestry. Only peasants and workers were trusted. Why? Because only peasants and workers could be trusted to be loyal. Rich people, or people with the inborn traits which led to being rich, will always have status in any natural society. They will always do all right. That's why they can't be trusted. The stakes are never high for them. If anything, they'd rather have more freedom to realize their talents. People of peasant stock, though, they came from the dregs of society. They know very well that all they have was given to them by the party. And so they will be loyal to the death, because they know it, if the communist regime falls, their status will fall as fast as a hammer in a well. And the same goes for everyone else, especially those ethnic minorities." End quote. The left's alliances may seem fragile to some, but a proper analysis of the motivations of each individual in each group shows that there is an overriding factor of necessity that will allow even the most opposed people to remain in cohesion. The left is a grand coalition of losers who, under normal conditions, would be of low status, but through collective action have displaced those who would otherwise have high status. The people on the left know this, and thus will remain loyal to the left, despite everything else, in order to prevent a return to normalcy, in which they would be reduced back to a lower status. Of course, there are always risks involved when attempting to form such a coalition. Spandrel continues, quote, Ethnics were tricky, though, because they always had a gambit which could increase their status even further independence. Which is why both Russia and China soon after consolidating the regime started to crack down on ethnics. Stalin famously purged Jews from the Politburo, used World War II to restore most of the Tsar's territory, and run such a Russia-centered state that to this day people in Kyrgyzstan speak Russian. The same in China, a little-known fact of the Cultural Revolution was the huge, bloody purge in Mongolia and the destruction of many temples in Tibet. After that was done with, the Communist Party became this strong, stable, and smooth machine. So again, the genius of Leninism was in building a ruling class from scratch and making it cohesive by explicitly choosing people from low-status groups, ensuring they would be loyal to the party given they had much to lose. It worked so well it was the marvel of the intellectual classes of the whole world for a hundred years. Meanwhile, what was the West doing? The West, that diehard enemy of worldwide communism, led by the United States. What has been the American response to Leninism? Look around you. Read Vox. Put on TV. Okay, that's enough. Who is high status in the West today? Women. Homosexuals. Transsexuals. Muslims. Blacks. There's even movements propping up disabled and fat people. What progressivism is running is hyper-Leninism. Biological Leninism. When communism took over Russia and China, those were still very poor, semi-traditional societies, plenty of semi-starved peasants around, so you could run a Leninist party just on class resentments. Quote, never forget class struggle, end quote, Mao liked to say. Never forget you used to be a serf, and you're not one now, thanks to me, he meant. In the West, though, by 1945, when peace and order was enforced by the United States, the economy had improved to the point where class struggle just didn't work as a generator of loyalty. Life was good. The proletariat could all afford a car and even vacations. Traditional society was dead. The old status ladders based on family pedigree and land-based wealth were also dead. The West, in 1960, was a wealthy, industrial, meritocratic society where status was based on one's talent, 
productivity, and natural ability to schmooze oneself into the ruling class. Of course, liberal politics kept being a mess. No cohesion in a ruling class, which has no good incentive to stick to each other. But of course, the incentive is still out there. A cohesive ruling class can monopolize power, and extract rents from the whole society forever. The ghost of Lenin is always there. And so the arrow of history kept bending in Lenin's direction. The West started to build up a Leninist power structure. Not overtly, not as a conscious plan. It just worked that way because the incentives were out there for everyone to see. And so, slowly we got it. Biological Leninism. That's the nature of the cathedral." End quote. Biological Leninism is Leninism spawned from the evolutionary process of a multitude of persons individually realizing the potential to incrementally gain power by exploiting the absence of a cohesive ruling class. There are those such as Gramsci who realized the potential of this method, and even some who followed through on this, but the cathedral is primarily something that has evolved as a bottom-up power structure. Gramsci and his followers didn't organize this, nor did anyone else. They simply provided an extra push. There may have been no cohesive ruling class, but there were certainly many high-status people to push out of the way. Spandrel describes them, quote, If you live in a free society and your status is determined by your natural performance, then it follows that to build a cohesive Leninist ruling class, you need to recruit those who have natural low status. In any society, men have higher performance than women. They are stronger, they work harder, they have a higher variance, which means a fatter right tail in all traits, more geniuses, and they have the incentive to perform what the natural mating market provides. That's the patriarchy for you. Now, I don't want to overstress the biology part here. It's not the fact that all men are better workers than women. In a patriarchy, there's plenty of unearned status for men. But that's how it works. The core of society is the natural performance of men. Those men will naturally build a society which benefits them as men. Some men free ride on that, some women get a bad deal. Lots of structural inertia there. But the core is real. To get to the point, in 1960 we had a white men patriarchy. This was perfectly natural. Every society with a substantial proportion of white men will end up being ruled by a cabal of white men. Much of it's biology. Part of it is also social capital, good cultural practices accumulated since the 15th century. White men just run stuff better. They are natural high status. But again, nature makes for messy politics. There is no social value on acknowledging truth. Everybody can see that. The signaling value is in lies, in the unnatural. As Moldbug put it, quote, In many ways, nonsense is a more effective organizing tool than the truth. Anyone can believe in the truth. To believe in nonsense is an unforgeable demonstration of loyalty. It serves as a political uniform. And if you have a uniform, you have an army. End quotes. Of course, everyone listening today will be familiar with the lack of social value in acknowledging the truth. The truth, as Spandrel puts it, is that any society that has a core of white men will result in a society run by white men. This is simply what will happen, naturally, biologically when sufficiently large numbers of people are in free competition with one another, and there is a sizable block of white men. But they won't form a cohesive ruling class. Let's get back to Spandrel. Quote, The point again is that you can't run a tight, cohesive ruling class with white men. They don't need to be loyal. They'll do okay anyway. A much easier way to run an obedient, loyal party is to recruit everyone else. Women. Blacks. Gays, Muslims, transsexuals, pedophiles, those people may be very high performers individually, but in a natural society ruled by its core of high performers, i.e. a white patriarchy, they wouldn't have very high status. So if you promise them high status for being loyal to you, you bet they're going to join your team. They have much to gain, little to lose. The coalition of the fringes, Sailor calls it. It's worse than that, really. It's the coalition of everyone who would lose status the better society were run. It's the coalition of the bad, literal cacistocracy. There's a reason why there's so many evil fat women in government. Where else would they be if government didn't want them? They have nothing going on for them, except their membership in the Democratic Party machine. The party gives them all they have, the same way the Communist Party had given everything to that average peasant kid who became a middling bureaucrat in Moscow. And don't even get me started with hostile Muslims or transsexuals. Those people used to be expelled or taken into asylums pre-1960. 
which is why American progressivism likes them so much. The little these people have depends completely on the left's patronage. There's a devil's bargain there. The more naturally repulsive someone else, the more valuable it is as a party member, as its loyalty will be all the stronger. This is of course what's behind Larry Oster's first law of minority relations. The worse a group behaves, the more the left likes it. This is also why the left today is the same left that was into Soviet communism back in the day. What they approve of today would scandalize any 1920s leftist, even 1950s leftist. But it's all the same thing, following the same incentives, how to build a cohesive ruling class to monopolize state power. It used to be class struggle, now it's gender struggle and ethnic struggle. Ethnic struggle works in America because immigrants have no territorial power base, unlike in Russia or China. So the old game of giving status to low-status minorities works better than ever. It works even better, unlike Lenin's Russia. America has now access to every single minority on Earth which is why the American left is busy importing as many Somalis as they can, the lowest performing minority on Earth. Just perfect. Yes, it's all madness, but it works. It really works like a charm. The richest parts of America, California, and New York are now a one-party state. America has legislation which forces every private enterprise of size to have a proportion of women, of black people, and sexual deviants, who of course know they don't belong there, and thus are extremely faithful political commissars, more faithful than the actual official political commissars that communist China has also in their private companies." End quote. Many people will be familiar with the Stasi who police modern-day companies. There are many misapprehensions regarding why private companies behave in the left-wing manner that they do, extending all the way to blaming capitalism or free markets themselves. However, the progressive nature of companies is not primarily due to economic reasons, but to ideological reasons, enforced by the Stasi agents embedded in companies. Globalism is a means of spreading this model of control across the world. Quote, and biological Leninism is extremely powerful overseas, too. The same way that Soviet communism all had natural fifth columns across the world, with industrial workers forming parties and all doing Moscow's bidding across the West, American biological Leninism is also an extremely strong means of agitation all over the world." End quote. There are always low-status people in any civilization, and America agitates them in other countries to undermine these nations in the same way that has been done in the West. The word for this today is globo-homo. Whether or not globo-homo will succeed is a question too grand to address here, and more interesting is the path it will take in the American nation that birthed it. Quote, the question, of course, is how biological Leninism is going to evolve. Both Soviet and Chinese Leninism changed a lot during their tenure. Stalin purged the party very hard, and after some decades, when all the memories of the pre-Soviet era were gone, and their power was secure, the CPSU started promoting high-performing, by the requirements of a political party, not a rocket science department, that is, Russian males which didn't care much when the whole Soviet state collapsed. I guess they're doing quite okay right now. Same in China. Today, the CPC is by no means a peasants and workers party. It's a best guy of the class party. Loyalty is not insured by the threat of landowners coming back to ensurf them and their children. It's insured with a next-gen surveillance and propaganda apparatus. Note that both Russia and China kept class struggle as the official ideology which everybody was, and is, forced to parrot incessantly to keep their jobs. Russia and China both stopped their peasant cacistocracies after a few decades, but they already had a nominal single-party dictatorship, and centuries of tradition of autocracy to feed upon. America is still 20 years away, if not 10, from a single-party regime, and it has a tradition of adversarial democracy, which makes it very hard to stop the ratchet. Even if it stopped, the ideology is already there. In the best-case scenario, where a democratic single-party regime gets its Stalin to purge the country of agitators and stabilize the regime, you still get 2020 rhetoric frozen as the state religion. Women are sacred, can't even joke about them, Islam is peace, transsexuals get to retroactively change their birth certificates. It's not okay to be white. White men get to run the country, but they must parrot all this stuff five times a day, facing at the Great Zimbabwe." End quote. The end of Spandrel's first essay is very interesting, and points out that once totalitarian control is achieved, leftward movement stops. 
the regime is then frozen in place, with no further progress in its ideology. This is because it is no longer necessary. The ideology is merely a means to an end, and that end is totalitarian control. One may wonder what the ultimate goal, purpose, or function of the cathedral is, and this is it. Totalitarian control is the end in and of itself, not for any stated propagandistic reason, such as uplifting the disadvantage, but for power and only power. To go from low status to high status, when reacting against the left, it is critical to realize that all of their rhetoric only serves this end. The basic followers may not realize it, and they are all the more pitiful for it, but there is no purpose in the left other than to seize power for itself. There is no moral argument to be had with such a force. The only way to oppose it is to likewise engage in this ruthless power struggle and win. This red pill is a liberating one, because it absolves you of having to deal with any of the left's moral claims. There is no moral ground on the left, and therefore, any debate over morality with the left is purely tactical. A moral reactionary owes the left nothing. History demonstrates this truth of the left. We can look beyond the facile examples of the Soviet Union and various other communist countries, and look at the French Revolution, Oliver Cromwell, and the latter days of the Roman Republic. The nature of the left is less a matter of the sincerity or lack thereof of any particular person, and more of a law of nature. The left moves as far left as it needs to, drops as many principles as it must, and disregards any mores that hold it back to achieve power. Spandrel's second essay is very short, and we will grab most of the second half of it to examine. Quote, as Royce would tell you, a man or a woman is only as loyal as his options. So the ideal politician is the man who doesn't have anything else going on for him. Someone for whom being a politician is the best thing that ever happened to him. Somebody who positively knows that if he ever leaves the party, his status would drop. Marco Rubio say, he'll play ball, he better. Any system ruled by political parties will always move to the left. Their business model is based on getting low-status people to work for them. Obviously, they must give them something in exchange, and they must motivate voters to vote for them. Their promise is simple. You, low-status people, help us out, vote for us, obey our commands, and we will give you high status. Don't vote for us, disobey us, let the right win, and you will remain low-status. The left always wins, but once they win, they become higher status. Come on, they got power. They try very hard to convince everyone that they're not really in power. No, the forces of reaction are lurking everywhere. We must keep on the struggle. 80% of the left's energy is in producing propaganda about how the right really runs everything. When the left had 90% tax rates, they still talked as if they were in Charles Dickens' world. After 60 years of feminism, affirmative action, and Jews in all resorts of power, the left of 2017 is obsessed with systemic racism, toxic masculinity, and anti-Semitism. Right. But of course the left has been in power for 200 years now. Once they got power, they got enjoyed their hardly fought high status. Naturally, they lost discipline, until a party further left appeared, and then won. And so on and so forth. Cthulhu always swims left. That's where power is. First, they captured the electoral system. Arguably, it's the easy. But power is not only in Parliament. Separation of powers is, or at least was, real. A Parliament can pass a law. The executive could delay or outright ignore its execution. A judge could find or make up some flaw in the law and block it. It is of no use to have a legislative majority having the ability to pass laws at will if you can't effectively put them into practice. Power is absolute power, or it is no power at all. But where there's a will, there's a way, and there is always someone with a will to power. Eventually, the left found a way. Well, two ways. Stay tuned. End quote. The explanation for what a politician is explains why we see so many gremlins in the leadership of political parties. The perfect politician is someone who couldn't possibly do anything else. Pete Buttigieg comes to mind in this regard. This type of person will do whatever the controllers holding their leash tells them to do. Building power on people like this inevitably results in further degeneration to the left. As more and more low-status people are exploited, it is a scramble to the bottom. This is where the individual analysis is so important. The left in reality is a bunch of individual people who all have their own selfish reasons to act in similar ways. It is easy to mistake the left as a collective, 
but the left merely proclaims collectivism as a mask of convenience over each and every leftist's lust. Collective ideologies hide their true motives. Remember, the only purpose of the left is to achieve power. This is why leftist coalitions infight, fragment, and reform further left. It's survival of the fittest for whoever can more ruthlessly undermine the other low-status people. This is inevitably even more low-status people. Of course, eventually this reaches a conclusion. The society can collapse completely into its decadence, or true hierarchy reasserts itself anywhere along the way, and competent leaders solidify control. This may sound nice to right-wingers, but of course, true hierarchy can also assert itself in the form of Joseph Stalin. Stay tuned for the next video.